Chapter 9, A Suggested Internal Program for a Citizens Homeland Security Association. This chapter is quite long at 40 pages, so it's going to be broken into three parts. Chapter 9, Part A. The first part of a CHA's program is internal. An effective program must emphasize at least five elements. Education, practical studies, communications among CHSAs, statewide central collection, collation, and dissemination of information, and intergenerational recruiting of new members. A. Education should be first and foremost in every CHSA's operations. Members must themselves understand and be able cogently to explain to others precisely why revitalization of the militia of the several states is vital to America's survival as a secure, free, and independent nation. Knowing why will provide members with the attitude and the motivation necessary to accomplish the tasks before them. Each CHSA should appoint a tutorial committee to establish a regular educational schedule, with some subjects specified for coverage at each meeting. Whenever possible, qualified speakers should be brought in for this purpose. Between meetings, study groups should work on research projects the groups devise or that the committee assigns. To facilitate these efforts, each CHSA or cluster should create a lending library of books, magazines and newsletters, VHS tapes, DVDs, CDs, and other materials, should compile a bibliography of books available at local public libraries, and a list of useful internet websites, and should consider maintaining its own internet website on which to present as much educational material as possible. Subjects for study and discussion should include the following. The principles of the Declaration of Independence and their relation to the Constitution. For Americans intent on revitalizing the militia of the several states, nothing could be more important than to understand the central teachings and controlling authority of the Declaration of Independence and specifically their relation to the militia. Most important among the Declaration's principles are the following. That Americans deserve to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. That is, we may take possession of and permanently retain our own national independence and sovereignty without anyone else's permission. And rather than arbitrary and extravagant claims that Americans assert this on no authority other than their own hubris, their national independence and sovereignty stand on an objective foundation. That all men are created equal. Not, to be sure, in terms of physical attributes and talents, but of inherent moral worth. No individuals or groups are somehow destined chosen or specially fitted for earthly political supremacy by dint simply of their geographical origin, their genesis in some supposedly superior or master race, their purported intelligence, or even, perhaps especially, their alleged divine selection, election, or predestination, or their adherence to secular humanism. Men's political equality derives from their common humanity, and disregards all individual and group peculiarities of nation, nature, nurture, or newman. Political equality being irrebuttably presumed, the purpose of all governments in America must be to secure the common defense, the general welfare, and the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, without exclusion or exception, and the equal protection of the laws to every person, rather than to serve the selfish ends of those grasping special interest groups the Founding Fathers denominated as factions, and generally denounced and despised. No doubt, every individual in America enjoys the absolute freedom to believe the opposite in the privacy of their own mind. But anyone who puts such an antisocial belief into practice through some overt act aimed at subverting, controlling, or overthrowing the government for his own private separate advantage and at everyone else's expense, thereby identifies themselves as at least an aspirant to tyranny, and therefore we the people's enemy. Of all the establishments within the Constitution's federal system, 
The militia of the several states embody to the greatest degree the principle of political equality. First, through universality, in that they consist of all able-bodied citizens from 16 to 60 years of age. Second, through ubiquity, in that they operate in every locality across the country. Third, through uniformity, in that they require the self-same general duty of service from everyone they enroll, although different individuals may satisfy their duties by performing different tasks according to their abilities. For that reason, the militia offer the best possible protection against the usurpation and tyranny of rogue politicians who cater to the demands of special interest groups for unequal treatment. Because in the final analysis all political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, when every able-bodied citizen self-consciously participates in the militia as a guardian of homeland security, the resulting dispersion of political power throughout society renders its seizure by a small group extremely difficult. For with checks and balances so prolific, few men cannot oppress most other men before some of their victims alert the rest of the people to their mutual danger, and enough of them then take effective action in self-defense. All men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Because unalienable rights do not derive from individual men or human institutions, they can never legitimately be taken away from some men by other men, except on the terms required or permitted by the laws of nature and of nature's God. For the creature can never contradict the creator. The Declaration would not have bothered to emphasize this self-evident truth, however, had not the Founding Fathers both experienced repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states, through the systematic abridgment of their unalienable rights, and expected that such events could occur again. No one knew better than they that rights unalienable in principle can be threatened with extinction in practice. And therefore, a right without a remedy is as if it were not. For every beneficial purpose, it may be said not to exist. But as well, no one knew better than they that such a remedy then actually existed in the militia of the several states, as first proven at Lexington and Concord on 19 April 1775. From this knowledge, the founders handed down the syllogism that in a free state, everyone enjoys unalienable rights. A well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. Therefore, the militia are necessary for the protection of unalienable rights. Consequentially, Americans' unalienable rights imply an unavoidable duty, too. That is why militia have always been compulsory or draft organizations. Being necessary to the security of a free state, they cannot depend on the merely adventitious, whimsical support of the citizenry. A corollary of this conclusion must be that the militia of the several states are establishments, the existences of which are required by the self-same laws of nature and of nature's God that entitle men in the first instance to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station in their own free state. That is, Insofar as Americans assert a right to national independence and sovereignty, they must also accept the duty to preserve that status and authority by communal self-defense. And insofar as they refuse to fulfill that duty, they forfeit their claim to independence and sovereignty. Among these unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The right to life necessitates an immediate remedy for any attempted deprivation because once abridged, the right is forever lost. This implies an absolute right to individual self-defense. And by extension, throughout society, an absolute right to communal self-defense too. As, Blacks as Blackstone described it, a right that is not, neither can it be, in fact, taken away by the law of society. But even a theoretically absolute right to self-defense could not provide an immediate remedy unless individuals in groups were also guaranteed permanent possession of the implements historically proven necessary to defeat aggression, namely firearms. Therefore, the right to life must entail the right to keep and bear arms, 
for both individuals and the community, which for most people reduces to the duty to keep and bear arms in the militia, because whoever fulfills the duty will always possess the arms that are subject to the right. Similarly, at the bare minimum, liberty must include the freedom to do whatever may be necessary and proper to secure life, because liberty does not exist without life. Self-evidently, then, each individual in society's communal liberty embraces the primary freedom to possess the implements necessary to protect life, typically firearms, and the secondary freedom to deal with others to obtain those implements through a fundamentally free market. And that, not surprisingly, was the manner in which most members of the pre-constitutional colonial and state militia obtained their firearms pursuant to law. To secure these unalienable rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Because we the people are the earthly source of all governments in America, neither any government as an institution, nor any particular office holders as individuals, can claim superiority to the people. In the final analysis, there are no authorities but the people. Neither government nor officials can claim any inherent authority, only delegated, and therefore defined and limited. Powers derived from the consent of the governed. And both government and officials always labor under the inherent disability that absent proof of a delegation of power from we the people, their actions lack authority and are illegitimate. Thus, an unconstitutional act is not a law. It confers no rights, it imposes no duties. It is, in legal contemplation, as inoperative as though it had never been passed. Moreover, even delegated powers must always be construed and applied according to the precept that the only powers government and public officials may exercise are just powers. Even we the people can never consent to the delegation of unjust powers, because under the laws of nature and of nature's God that allow the people to exercise sovereignty in the first place, all laws to be laws must be just the militia of the several states consist of the vast majority of we the people, but no more, and therefore no less limited in their freedom of action, by the laws of nature and of nature's God, than are the people as a whole. Therefore, as applied to the militia, the root truth that in the final analysis all political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, must be qualified by the condition only if the muzzle points towards a justifiable target. That being so, the militia are the ultimate guarantors of justice in society. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, or to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Because every form of government has failed in the past, any form of government might do so in the future. Therefore, suspicions of public officials are always warranted, and protections against their betrayals of the public trust are always necessary. These protections may arise either within or outside a form of government. Those who constitute we the people need not wait or depend upon a form of government already proven faulty to protect them, but instead may take direct action. Otherwise, they could never alter or abolish an old government and institute new government. And because it is we the people's right and duty to take such action, it is the duty of all public officials to acquiesce in and not in any way to oppose or obstruct it. For laying the foundation of a new form of government on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness, can mean no less than that the people determine the process and control the outcome exclusively and absolutely. The militia of the several states are not simply largely coincident with we the people taken as individuals, 
Rather, the militia constitute the people, and through them the states, and through them the nation, in arms. So if, in some political extremity, the people as sovereigns must call ourselves forth in the militia to correct the errors or crimes of an existing form of government, or to lay the foundation and organize the powers of a new one, forcible resistance by the delinquent public officials, politicians, or special interest groups amounts to treason against we the people. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government, and to provide new guards for their future security. We the people should throw off, in whole or in part, a bad political regime only when the necessity has been proven, which is a fundamental determinant of the justice of taking up arms in any cause. But we the people ourselves must be the sole and final judges of that proof. As Blackstone taught, whenever a question arises between the society at large and any magistrate vested with powers originally delegated by that society, it must be decided by the voice of the society itself. There is not upon earth any other tribunal to resort to. Thus, we the people must determine by and for ourselves what constitutes intolerable abuses and usurpations by public officials and selfish special interest groups and when these evidence a design to reduce the people under absolute despotism. At that point, to exercise with our own hands our own sovereign power against our feckless and faithless representatives is not simply we the people's right, but also our duty. Because we cannot go on for long without a proper government that actually tries to the best of its ability to secure our unalienable rights. Yet to vindicate that right and to effectuate that duty requires a means both always available and likely efficacious. As first proven on 19 April 1775, the militia of the several states are that means, always available because the militia are the people ourselves and likely efficacious because the right of the citizens to keep and bear arms offers a strong moral check against the usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers, and will generally, even if these are successful in the first instance, enable the people to resist and triumph over them. By incorporating the militia of the several states within its federal system, beyond the authority of Congress or the states to disestablish, the Constitution implicitly recognizes the right and the duty of the people to throw off bad government before it degenerates into absolute despotism. Being in this way necessary to the security of a free state, the militia cannot be suffered to depend for their existence and preparedness solely on the integrity, intelligence, and diligence of we the people's representatives, or for their enrollment on the merely adventitious enthusiasm of the most patriotic citizens. After all, the people's representatives may be the very culprits who need correction, and the people's safety cannot be left to laissez-faire, but must be guaranteed by making every eligible citizen's participation in the militia mandatory, because how it is practicable to keep the people duly armed without some organization, it is difficult to see. A tyrant typically refuses his assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So we the people may take as a reliable indicium of a design to reduce us under absolute despotism the calculated refusal by public officials to enact constitutional militia laws, especially when called upon to do so. A tyrant typically affects to render the military independent of and superior to civil power. 
So another indicium of such a pernicious design is the employment of the National Armed Forces and the paramilitarization of state and local police, not for we the people's security in the homeland, but for rogue public officials' security over the homeland. The militia of the several states provide the best check and balance against these developments because they are composed of local citizen soldiers with the emphasis in the right place. Which is why, when militarization of society is afoot, the militia are studiously neglected or even suppressed, as, for instance, through general gun control. A tyrant typically combines with others to subject the people to a jurisdiction foreign to their constitution and unacknowledged by their laws. Indeed, any effective tyrant must do so, or the domestic laws he is violating will threaten to put him down. For example, a jurisdiction may be foreign in the sense, first, of permitting what the Constitution prohibits, or prohibiting what it permits, through purposeful disregard or misconstruction. Second, of relying on foreign law, or succumbing to the pressure of foreign alliances to interpret the Constitution or laws of the United States, so as to incorporate alien principles therein. Or worst of all, third, of stripping America of her sovereignty by subjecting her to schemes for regional, hemispheric, and global governance. In any case, the militia of the several states must be the ultimate guardians of the Constitution, because they, along with the President as their commander-in-chief, are the only entities and officers it expressly empowers to execute the laws of the Union, first among which is the Constitution. And nowhere does the Constitution license anyone, by any means, to enforce against Americans the laws of any jurisdiction foreign to the United States. To like effect, the Constitution empowers the militia to repel invasions, whether of openly lost foreign aggressors, or of forces claiming to impose upon Americans the purported laws of some supranational entity. A tyrant typically quarters large bodies of armed troops among the population and protects them through mock trial from punishments for any crimes or murders which they may have committed on the inhabitants. The killings at Ruby Ridge, the promiscuous slaughter at Waco, and numerous other outrages that never achieve such notoriety in the mass media exemplify how the general government's armed forces and investigative agencies, and state and local police departments too, increasingly receive immunities from criminal prosecution, civil suit, and other legal consequences when they brutalize common Americans under color of orders from their political superiors. We the people can never enjoy true homeland security while we remain subject to the threat of being framed for crimes by agents provocateurs, assassinated by snipers, or gassed, incinerated, or otherwise treated as so many vermin by jackbooted thugs loosed upon us by our own national, state, or local governments. That orders from higher authority can never exculpate individual officers who participate in crimes against humanity is a staple of the modern law of nations. That the officer acted pursuant to order of his government or of a superior shall not free him from responsibility. Even more to the point, though, the Constitution requires the very same result. For if an order from higher authority commands the commission of a crime against humanity, being irremediably unjust, it is necessarily unconstitutional even if it closely mimics the forms of law. Being unconstitutional, it is no lawful order at all, and imposes no duties on anyone. Indeed, being at best an act of tyranny, such an order not only need not and should not be obeyed, but also should be affirmatively opposed and obstructed in every possible lawful manner. And whenever and wherever the regularly constituted agencies refuse or fail to act, the investigation of every such incident and the prosecution of the parties responsible should be initiated, 
supervised, enforced, or even conducted by the militia, whose members are the inhabitants of the places in which these crimes are perpetrated, and sometimes the victims of the wrongdoing too. The Constitution of the United States, and all state constitutions, derive from, and must conform to and promote, the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Even the Supreme Court has recognized that the first official act of this nation declared the foundation of government in these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. While such declaration of principles may not have the force of organic law, or be made on the basis of judicial decision as to the limits of right and duty, and while in all cases reference must be had to the organic law of the nation for such limits, Yet the latter is but the body and the letter, of which the former is the thought and the spirit. And it is always safe to read the letter of the Constitution in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. This constricted application of the Declaration forgets, however, that had the colonies failed to secure their independence by force of arms, and had the authority of the king been re-established in America, if the first official act of this nation had died a borning, no one could have contended that the colony's resistance against the crown, or their treatment of its loyal subjects, rested on any legal foundation, which is that the Constitution is properly law only because the Declaration of Independence is prior and higher law. Through and under the auspices of the Declaration, not the Constitution, the colonies assumed among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, and then asserted that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, and that as free and independent states they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do, which includes all acts of a legislative, executive, and judicial nature appertaining to sovereign governments. Thus, the states individually, and we the people collectively, took up our sovereign powers per force of the principles of the Declaration. And our sovereignty was recognized by other nations that accepted the Declaration as part of the law of nations, staying the fact of and the legal grounds for the colony's separation from Great Britain. For that reason, we the people cannot exercise our sovereignty in any manner that contradicts its origin in and nature as defined by the Declaration of Independence. We cannot form state constitutions and enact our own state laws or combine the states in a more perfect union of the United States of America under the Constitution, or perforce of the Constitution, empower a general government, and through the general government enact laws in any manner inconsistent with the Declaration. Rather, we must always exercise our political powers only on the basis of, and to advance in mankind's estimation, the Declaration's principles. Therefore, it is not simply safe, but always necessary, to read, construe, and especially apply the letter of the Constitution according to the letter of the Declaration. In addition, the principles that the Declaration enumerates did not arise out of nowhere, set out for the very first time in human history in that document. As the Declaration itself makes clear, they derived from the laws of nature and of nature's God and the self-evident truths those laws embody, which the Declaration presumed were known to and generally accepted by mankind throughout the Western world. And perhaps nothing can be more self-evident than that the laws of nature and nature's God did not entitle the colonies to sovereignty, but then also license them to exercise that sovereignty in a manner contradictory to those very laws. So, for example, because, according to the Declaration, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, we the people, through the Constitution, can delegate only just powers to the general government. The substance of justice, so the Declaration presumes, 
can and must be discovered in the laws of nature and of nature's God. Therefore, the proper limits of every constitutional power must be derived from the language in which that power is expressed, construed were doubtful in the light of natural law. As components of the Constitution's federal system, the militia of the several states cannot act contrary to the principles of the Declaration either. Indeed, how could they? As mentioned above, the militia are inferable from, and even compelled by, those principles. Part A of Chapter 9, End